Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Stefan Berensky. I'm the chief editor of the Aerospatium magazine. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was in, uh, in Geneva at the United Nations, and we were discussing space as the next objective for sustainable development, because space is the place for infrastructure, and space is a place that is that today as for the rest of the Earth, actually, as a problem of pollution. This problem is space debris. Space debris multiply. The activities in low Earth orbit are multiplying too. Uh, the number of satellites in uh, low Earth orbit has doubled in the last two years and will double again uh, very shortly and multiply again. There are also big infrastructures in, uh, in low Earth orbit like the space station and now we have two space stations and very soon we may have more. That means more people, more people are at risk. The satellites for Earth observation are on very specific orbits and then they have to cross old Soviet stages on other satellites that sometimes were not deorbited timely or properly. Uh, all this is a really, it has always been a problem. Now it is really a big problem. And uh, we have a very interesting panel today to discuss this issue. Uh, with us, we have Christophe Bonal from CNES, who is senior expert at, this, uh, at the uh, uh, division of launchers. Uh, or for me, is Mr. Debris. I will, will come back to that. We have Luisa Innocenti from ISA, who is uh, the head of the Clean Space Program. I think the name speaks for itself. We have Alain de Clerc, who is a business uh, development manager of uh, Leo Labs, which is a really interesting venture, believe me. And another very interesting venture, it's uh, Clear Space, not to mix with Clean Space, Clear Space in Switzerland, and uh, Luc Piguet is a CEO and founder. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So let's start. So is the situation as worse, as uh, bad as I uh, presented it? I'd like to have the advice of Mr. Debris on that. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Stefan. You know very well the answer because you've been following the topic for so many years. <laughs> uh, I, I would say we, we traditionally we see three steps. The first step was, from, let's say, from Sputnik down to uh, 2007. Okay. So we're going slightly up to kind of uh, 200 new objects in space per year. And then second phase, Fengun uh, 1C, 2007, Iridium 33, Cosmos 2009. Then we took a step with 1,000 new objects per year in average. And then the so-called new space, as you said, all the new uh, ideas, wonderful things. We are using space so much. New ideas, new applications, new things, but new objects left up there. Uh, we have plenty of rules, plenty of rules, standout guidelines, code of conduct, laws, but that we don't apply, we don't comply with. And so, yes, definitely, today we are living a, 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 a very changing situation. And believe me, I wouldn't have said this 10 years ago. But today is really something is happening, and we should be careful. Hopefully, thanks to Luisa, we are careful. So, do you believe in the possibility of the Kessler syndrome? I don't believe. I think it is there. Definitely, between 700 kilometer and 1100 kilometer altitude, we have a Kessler syndrome. If you look, okay, I don't want to talk too much, but if you look between. Uh, we did the exercise. If you look between 760 and 840 kilometer altitude between two th year 2000 and today, we multiplied the number of objects there by 3.5. But the number of active objects in this zone is lowered by a factor of three. So it's crazy. So most three, three times less active objects there, three times more objects up there globally. So all this is just Kessler syndrome triggered by uh, Fenguin 1C and Iridium 3. And yes, for, for those who have not followed this as well yeah. as, as we did, uh, Fenguin 3C was the satellite that was destroyed by an uh, anti-satellite weapon 
uh, in China. And uh, Iridium, it's the collision between an Iridium and a Cosmos satellite. Uh, exactly, be... Iridium 33, which was an active telecommunication satellite, 800 kilograms more or less, and it met with an old uh, Russian or Soviet satellite above Siberia. And from their union uh, was generated some kind of 4,000 nice little babies, little babies, li meaning cataloged objects larger than the fist. And they are all ready to go and collide your satellite tomorrow. And this, uh, this cascading effect that is very famous from the film uh, Gravity, uh, probably you saw Gravity. Gravity is a wonderful film, remarkable. Just try to imagine it. Instead of being lasting one and a half hour, it should last 15, hour, uh, 15 years. And then Gravity is perfect. But this is really what's happening. So, uh, so I remember when, uh, when we met for the first time, Luisa, uh, we were discussing the uh, deorbiting of a huge European satellite that was not planned from the beginning. Uh, well, it was an old design. It was not planned to be deorbited. And unfortunately, uh, well, it failed in orbit. It's a huge, like the size of an autobus. I remember it was a double-decker bus uh, as a symbol. And with a big, big, big uh, uh, solar array, 30 meters. And uh, when it was alive, it had to move twice a year to avoid collisions. It's been quite a long time now, it's been inactive. So the idea was to find a way to deorbit it. And that's why, if I remember well, clean space was created. What has uh, been done since? And uh, well, I know that. And Vsat is no longer the primary target, but what? How did ESA react? Okay, what happened was this: um, as you said, Envisat was not designed to be uh, deorbited since the very beginning. There was not enough awareness of the problem of debris at the moment of uh, designing it, so we didn't consider the deorbitation as a mandatory step. I hope that today things would be di uh, will be different. And that's what we are fighting for. Um, there is a long story that we will probably not enter here, which makes it that uh, it's easier from a legal point of view to take down your own object, because there is a story of responsibility. That's the reason why, as a group of uh, young or less young enthusiastic people, we said that we need to show it and we need to develop it, the biggest debris which ESA owns and we said. We went up to phase B1. We studied different technology means to uh, catch it and deorbit it. And then uh, we needed the, the big budget to really build it. And basically, it was very difficult. The member state did not follow us. Why? Because cleaning waste is not seen as interesting. Okay, we, we can say it in all different ways you want, but that's the point. The question, what the people were telling me is, it's a fantastic mission, it's true, it's technologically challenging, makes everybody dream, it's true, it's very European in values because it's environment, but what's going to happen after? And we kept on saying, it's the opening up to in-orbit servicing. Ah, but what is the business? We don't know. It will come. Basically, we didn't get it. Uh, all other um, space activities, which could prove a kind of a business, uh, business, went in front of us. The situation changed with the arrival of the large constellation, mega constellation, because they will have to manage the end of life. So, in 2019, or a bit before, we issued, we tried again with ESA, and this time we said to the whole uh, Europe, um, go and take down one of our debris. Again, our for a legal reason. And we provided the list. And tell us what's going to be the business case or the follow-up mission after the first one. And uh, we did a competition, and at the end, the winner was a startup called Clear Space, which was issued by uh, the EPFL, which was the leader of a consortium of very experienced uh, uh, European in, um, industrialists who knew 
what to do as well. So it's not only the startup, it's the consortium which won the uh, contract. To the orbit, a smaller debris, but that's okay. It still would, will be the first space debris, uh, active debris removal mission worldwide when we will do it. Okay, well, that leads me to go to the space janitor, which is a, a very noble task, actually. <laughs> And that's why it's the Swiss, known for their cleanliness, the, would do it. Uh, how did you enter this uh, competition, this uh, selection? Why and, uh, and uh, how did you win? So we, we were working on the problem of space debris since 2010, right? In 2009, we launched a, a CubeSat into uh, the field of debris of the Cosmos Iridium collision and realized that this is a problem that needs a solution. So within EPFL, there's been a long-term long work done behind the question, how do you pick up a debris in orbit and deorbit it? Uh, in 2017, we saw one web getting funded and we thought this, this has to go faster than we go. So we need to create a startup to do that. So that, that we, we spun off into a startup beginning of 2018. And um, so for us, it, it's, uh, we, we built up on, on, the, on the years of research and work done uh, within EPFL uh, to uh, to start on our proposal. I think one important factor uh, in the development of what we did is the timing, is really the timing. What Louisa said, the fact that uh, suddenly it became really cheap, much cheaper to send a kilogram into orbit, uh, that you have all those constellations that start launching. Uh, you can build satellites much smaller uh, to uh, to make a much cheaper operation overall. And I think this is really what motivated us to say, yeah, th th there is a commercial model for it. When we looked at it, it was a little looking at a, 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 a motorway infrastructure across a continent that doesn't have any tow truck, right? So rather than talking, talking about a, a cleanup service, it's more, we look at it like a tow truck service, right? Where the idea is to be able to interact with object in space, and that's something we need if we want to continue developing the, the space infrastructure uh, in the future. So it's more servicing than only deorbiting. We, we look at it like that, because what, once you're able to, uh, to rendezvous with an object in space, uh, once you're able to capture it in orbit, once you've got all the sensors and the robotics to do that, then there's so many other things you can actually do, right? You don't need necessarily only to remove a piece of debris, you can also eventually refuel a satellite, you can extend the life of uh, the mission life of a satellite, you can do a lot of other things just with this set of technologies that we're developing on this first mission. Well, and for uh, rendezvous and uh, servicing and active debris removal, collision avoidance, uh, there's something which is really important, it's to know where things are, and uh, I'm really happy a few years ago uh, at uh, another uh, conference I, I met uh, with Wolf of Leo Labs, who have a very interesting story on how they became to develop radars to observe the sky. Please tell us the story. Yes, yeah, so well, the, the origins of Leo Labs are really in research, and a group of scientists have been working for a decade together to uh, do study of the ionosphere and had built with some government research funds a, a radar in Alaska that looked up to study the aurora borealis. And uh, in the course of doing that research, there was a lot of other data collected, which was, in a sense, noise obstructing the, 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 the science that was going on. And the team got very good at taking that particular data or that noise, calling it out, and throwing it away. And uh, so in a, in a case of one man's trash is another man's treasure, it was discovered that the, the uh, information that was being cast away was actually the information about satellites and debris. And about the same time that happened, there was some interest in this uh, from some agencies and the government and so on to say, well, this is of great interest to us. And so the notion of, well, let's, let's build a commercial uh, enterprise to go, uh, go after that track the space debris, track the satellites, build a platform so that people can get access to that information and use that, whether it's for satellite constellations, 
for sustainability with space agencies, for the academic community, for the insurance industry to characterize risk, and also for security and keeping things open and transparent. So the origins were in a sense very serendipitous, but it was the application of, of uh, sensor technology to low Earth orbit. And so now today you provide the data, the service, what do you sell? So what we do is we built, a, we're in the process of building a kind of constellation of ground-based phased array radars around the world. They collect the information on the objects in LEO, um, put it in this platform, and then our business model is to provide subscription to different services for data, for collision avoidance, for maneuver detection for proximity operations, the kinds of things that our customer base are interested in, all from a single platform. It's really impressive, which reminds me of uh, <laughs> the, one of the things I've been told for many, many years, it's we can't deal with debris through regulations, international regulations, uh, and now the big world is space traffic management, and I don't think we are going anywhere these days, uh, or maybe uh, I think it's something we should have developed 10 years ago. Uh, what is the position of the agencies on that? <laughs> Very difficult to say what is the position of the agency. I will tell you what is, um, um, at the moment, my position. Uh, so, first of all, the experts are clear. The standards are there. There are ISO standards which clearly describe what, what needs to be done. So the story of hiding behind uh, there is no regulation, I don't like it. And I don't believe it's true. The launching states have a responsibility and have the responsibility to check that what the scientists have uh, described worldwide because uh, is going to be applied. Will they do it? That's a different discussion. And uh, I don't know uh, what is faster, if uh, it is uh, to have a discussion worldwide in saying it needs to be applied, there are going to be penalties, or being the champion and uh, applying it and giving a good image thanks to that. I don't know which one of the two is going to be faster. I do care that uh, it's going to be done. And I think it's also important that we show that it can be done, that we can remove object, that we can manage in an effective way the end of the end of life of satellite. So at least from a technical point of view, nobody can say, yeah, but it cannot be done. When I started to uh, talk about the uh, ED orbit, that's the name, a lot of people were telling me two things. First of all is that there are synergies with the military. Why should you do it? Or why will you be allowed to do it? And I would say simply because we are cleaning up and we are being transparent. So we are not doing any harm to anybody. And in fact, nobody stopped it for that reason. It was stopped because of a lack of business, if you want. And second was, ah, but there are rules. There is, there is, there is no legislation, so why? And I would say, OK. The two should proceed. We will show that it can be done, and then we hope that worldwide there is going to be an agreement. It is clear that it cannot be only a European agreement. That's the point. I don't believe that we will be able to say we should only do it in Europe. It has to be worldwide. Yeah, I'm impressed by how much we, we share exactly this position. It was really an agency's position. 100% share what Luisa said, so all the regulations are already there since quite in quite a long time. <coughs> uh, today, so just to come to the question of the space traffic management. Space traffic management is a big word, very sexy, everyone is jumping on the words. But basically, what, what does it mean? It means the kind of rules of the road, we have them. There are a couple of them missing, but what is fundamental there is uh, what is the basis upon which we can apply these rules? And this basis is knowledge. Knowledge of what we have above our heads. And this is extremely important, much more important today than it used to be 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Today, the top priorities, we call it SST, space 
surveillance and tracking. You can call it uh, SSA, space surveillance and awareness, uh, space situational awareness, you can call it STM, okay, depending on who is talking. It's, but basically it means, what do I have above my head? So where, wh where are the objects? How, how good do I know them? Down to what, what size? Are we talking about 10 centimeter or 5 centimeter? Or Alan was telling me, okay, now we go down to 2 centimeter. And then the accuracy, uh, accuracy of the orbit. If you know that you have an object of the size of the fist, which is there, plus or minus one kilometer, well, well uh, okay, it's hard to do something correct with it. So all the work that we are doing today is how to get something much more precise. Instead of plus or minus one kilometer, we need to gain a factor 100, for instance. And for this, we are developing solutions such as uh, laser ranging, uh, things like this, or waiting for your very good results to come. But, but we'll see. So these are, if you want, this is the basis of the, of the space traffic management. Get very valuable, uh, an excellent catalog, precise, extremely accurate. And with this, then you can do what you want in terms of collision avoidance. Uh, re-entry management and uh, fragmentation and things like this. And the, the, the other problem I see is, uh, well, if there are regulations, how to make them applied? Because, yeah, for, for instance, yeah. we had this problem twice in the last month uh, with uh, China putting on, on orbit a huge stage without any way of uh, orbiting it properly. Okay, I'll take my, my devil's... Uh, Okay, the huge stage is much smaller than all the uh, Falcon 9 upper stages which are up there and which have already fell. <laughs> but okay, I'll let you, I'll let okay, you look. No, it's, okay, it's interesting uh, to say it. <laughs> interesting to say they had 19 re-entry, 19 random re-entries of 5 tons. That's more than 1 tons 12. Okay, end of the parenthesis. But you're right, we, th these are the rules that then need to be applied. And one of the problem is... Um, even when there are rules, they are not applied. You know, I don't want to re-quote my favorite enemy, but uh, we need to apply the rules once they are written. And so the question, which is excellent that you, you raised, is how to do so at international level. And clearly, what we have today, we see that we need to share the principles at international level. For instance, through standards, ISO standards are very fun. But the, the effective uh, legal aspect has, can only remain national. It's really a national responsibility. It's na so, for instance, we share with uh, we share with U.S., we share with China, Russia, uh, India, and, and so on. All these uh, all these rules about space traffic management, the, the key the key rules, such as you shall not collide, or if you know that you will collide, you shall move. But the threshold itself and the legal obligation is at national level today. And I, I think will remain for quite a long time. Well, that, that, that uh, puts a question. Uh, so we have governments, uh, they fund systems to survey the skies. Uh, how do you make a business in front of public services? Well, I first say that I think we absolutely 100% of our company every day works on solving the uh, issue raised by Luisa. And that is how do you make sustainability actionable? And how do you put teeth behind policy that to a large extent is quite mature? There's a lot of consensus already on behavior and the rules of the road, but there is no way to track compliance. There's no way to uh, understand in advance if they're uh, if if we're improving or not the environment we're going into. So uh, the in, my, in our estimation, the largest barrier to effective sustainability is solving something we refer to as the data deficit. And the data deficit means we've got to migrate from the past fifty years of a very sparse data environment where the frequency of observation, the ability to see small debris, and to get a complete picture of the information has never been there. So there's never been enough data to actually train an algorithm to look to see how constellations are behaving or to anticipate 
whether policy is being followed. So the data deficit is what we build our network for, and our our hope is that in a, in a short amount of time we'll get to a point where we see every object on every orbit frequently enough to be able to attribute uh, a cause and effect on whether a collision is uh, is is going to happen or not, and how we manage these assets. So. Um, data deficit is really what we're trying to do, and I think if we go to that next level, then we'll have the data for the first time to start implementing the policies that I think we'll find easy. It's not very often that you have policy way ahead of technology, but I think that's actually true in the case of space. And uh, so we're, we're going to help technology catch up. Well, and uh, I must confess regarding the uh, clear space uh, mission, there is something that annoys me. Uh, we are we're talking about uh, space debris management, so the first thing is not to create new debris. So with clear space, uh, you will remove the uh, upper part of a Vispa um, adapter, and to do that, you will be launched inside a Vispa, which means that another Vispa will be upper part will be uh, uh, ejected, jettisoned. Uh, how, with that kind of design, can we reduce the, uh, the balance of debris? If to remove a debris, we have to create a debris. Should I answer? I'll, I'll go for it. So, okay, so uh, obviously there's a lot of work to be done in different sectors, including launchers, right? How do we design launchers? How do we make sure that launchers are more sustainable, more reusable? And, uh, and one of the dimensions of the mission that is planned is to organize as well the removal of the jettisoned Vespa. Uh, for us, clearly, the idea is to build up a reusable platform as well when, when it comes to the chaser, to the servicer. To be able to use a servicer multiple times, to be able to make that complete equation to work is not an easy thing to do in the first try, right? So. We are on a first mission where we have a baseline, which is relatively simple. We have one servicer, one object to pick up. In the case of the, of the launcher, there's a, there's a Vespa that goes up with us. Now there's two things that can be done, either come back, uh, the jet is on the, the Vespa low enough for it to re-enter rapidly into Earth's atmosphere. The other, the other option is to deorbit it in the frame of the mission as a secondary activity of the mission. Now, both dimensions have been assessed. Uh, very likely, we're going to go for the second one, uh, but there's still a lot of points that are open on the launcher itself. But on the long term, I agree with you. What we have to build is a solution that is sustainable and that makes sense when it comes to actually deorbit objects from space. There's another thing I think is really important. It comes back to what Luisa said before. The idea here is to build up the solution to remove excuses, right? Right now, if, if there's any problem in orbit, if, if, if a government has to suffer liabilities, the plaintiff has to demonstrate fault. But today, the, removing an object from leaving an object in space is not a fault because there's no solution to remove it. As long as there's no solution to remove an object from orbit, then you, you, can, you can say, well, I, 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 I cannot, it's not possible, it's too expensive, I cannot pay for it, it's a service that doesn't exist. So what we try to do here is to bring up the solutions so that there's no more excuses about leaving objects in orbit at the end of the mission when they fail. And, and I think this is a fundamental step to get there. So you have to see this mission as a first step on a long road than as a mission per se that solves all the problem in one shot. Stefan, can I compliment? Yeah, yeah, please, please. First of all, I, even though I'm the head of the Clean Space of, uh, Office, I don't think that we should stop doing everything in space. Because already the fact that we are here talking, we're using electricity, where does the electricity come from? So let's not go to extremes. So the rule says that we need to deorbit the object within 25 years. So, and because of the business, some of the, of the launches have to be dual launchers. So that's, uh, that's life if you want to survive in a commercial uh, um, uh, situation. So the point uh, is to put also the second Vespa 
in a deorbiting uh, orbit, which will make it re-enter within the 25 years or even shorter, and this can be done. The problem is then the possible loss of performance of the launcher and therefore the competition. So for that one, there is one solution, which is the launcher does it by itself, if you want. We're also studying a second solution within ESA, but not only for this uh, Vespa, but in general, which is a deorbiting kit to be put on board of all future satellites. And this would, could be the in-orbit demonstration, because at the end, in the future, we will have to continue to deorbit satellite. And again, it's something that you need to foresee since the very beginning, and it costs fuel, it costs, uh, if you want also, not money I don't, or in their current way, no, but it, it requires some investment in technology, innovation, so that this can be done in an effective way. So, and as ESA, we are also developing this for the future. Well, uh, I know that your system is designed to deorbit a non-cooperative object without any uh, plug or, or uh, grapple system. Uh, but uh, I've seen also one of the constellations that is being deployed has introduced on their platforms uh, grapple points in case they can't deorbit by themselves and they have to be towed by a, by a uh, let's say, a space tug. Uh, is this something that should be introduced on more satellites? Just as a question. I would say yes. <laughs> Obviously, I wouldn't say no. It makes uh, it makes picking up an, a satellite in orbit uh, easier. Um, the the dock tag, as they call it, on the on the on the uh, one web satellites uh, has another advantage. It's a relatively low cost for the operator, and then the cost for actually removing an object really occurs only when you have to remove it, when you have a mission where you have to pick up and and tow a, a satellite out of orbit. So in terms of timing, when you look at the cost structure, it makes much more sense than other solutions. So when we look at it from our perspective, yes, we think that satellites should be equipped with that kind of interfaces. Yeah, I would like just to react on the two last answers. First of all, we, we know you, and so of course your question was naughty somewhere, <laughs> tricky. Uh, I see it in a completely different way. I see really that the the clear space mission is a first ever. And, and very frankly, I just couldn't care less if it's a Vespa up or part or whatever. It's a demonstration from end to end that I can go and fetch something. Remember that for the active debris removal, the real ones that we're dealing with for Kessler syndrome and so on, we're talking about objects of five tons, seven tons or eight tons. So the question is not about the VOOP, which is a 120 kilogram or so. It's really, Thanks to what they are doing, they are demonstrating that okay, they will be able then to go and fetch. Uh, we just published the list of the 50 worst objects, so we you can go and pick anyone. And so, of course, we understand it, and Louisa explained it. It's normal that for this first demonstration, end-to-end -end demonstration, it's normal not to go and fetch the worst one. So let's start already with the VOOP. Believe me, the whoop is complex. It's probably tilting. It's probably um, uh, tumbling. It's, it's 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 black. It's black. <laughs> maybe it's black. Maybe it's black. You don't know because uh, with time things are changing in in space and uh, it's tumbling. You don't know where to catch it. You may have some cables. You may let's do it. It will be a wonderful thing. We'll upload and then, very it, frankly, you have cameras on it. Yeah. <laughs> very, yeah. Yeah. Very because frankly, the fact. It. Yeah. Very frankly, the fact that it's a whoop and the fact that there's another whoop, at least personally, I don't, I don't care at all. I need a, a demonstration end-to-end -end that it can be done. And then it opens the world for plenty of things, including your second question. When they know how to do it, then they can go and, and grapple the, the grapple on, the, on a satellite which was forcing for. And uh, complementing on the story of uh, having satellite to be equipped to be removed, also the future uh, sentinels will be equipped to be removed. They will 
they will be deorbited if they don't fail, because the failure is still there. So they are compliant with the controlled reentry, because at the moment that's the regulation. So they bring on board enough fuel to do the controlled reentry because they are big, so it has to be controlled. But they still will be equipped to be removed because uh, at the end, um, the hardware per se for allowing the deorbiting is very cheap. The moment we have again qualified, the recurrent cost is zero. It's not zero, but it's uh, negligible. So it's not a real extra cost to have all the future sentinels equi uh, equipped to be removed. So if they fail, maybe we will even get down those which failed, hopefully. And always there is a question of who pays. Well, if there is not much to pay, if uh, it's a standardized uh, dog tag or I don't know what, what would be the, the system that will be uh, used. Uh, big question is always who pays. And I remember that you told me that among your customers, you have insurers. Insurers. Uh, yes. So part of the equation is to, uh, is to characterize in a larger sense what the risk profile is in different parts of low Earth orbit. So I think I agree with Christoph that it, we're just talking on the, on the uh, active de debris removal side, we're, we're really at the threshold with the demonstration project. But um, I think our, our role with whether it's insurance or regulatory or the uh, AD, ADR type activity is to help create that list of 50, the highest priorities and to work with Luke, to work with, with innovators that are going to make that a regular routine activity. And so that in combination with the other part of debris uh, uh, mitigation, which is avoiding it, um, should get us, in a sense, to a point where we can really increase the capacity of LEO to accommodate new constellations. And, uh, you know, without the traffic systems in Paris, we couldn't, we couldn't, couldn't have the density of population and activity that you have, and that's what we've got to do. We've got to continue to increase the capacity with debris removal and with collision avoidance. I must confess, I love what you've done with this uh, idea of listing the most... Uh, if I can say two words about it, it's a, it's a remarkable article published in Acta Astronautica. I think it's the first time that we have an article a little bit sensitive like this, published by 12 different countries. We have China, Russia, India, and so on and so on. And they all came with their methods describing where their list and did a, a best list. And so we have a very clear list. And this, pa uh, this paper, the first author is Diane McKnight from Leo Labs, by the way. <laughs> you know, they are generating the problem and, and giving the solution. <laughs> yes, but uh, I mean, well, in Europe, there, is, there was a selection won by ClearSpace. What are the others doing? Yeah, I think probably Luke can answer. What is the competition? So yeah, the, the competition, there's, there's a few companies. Obviously, there's a lot of companies working on the question of in-orbit servicing, right? So you have, for example, in, in the US, you have Northrop Grumman that's been demonstrating the MEV mission, mm -hmm. where they extend the life of a satellite in, in geostationary. Um, that's not debris removal, that's life extension. Otherwise, and there's and it's a, a bigger, it's a much, much bigger, bigger kind of satellite, like like the ones we have up here. So and uh, and then you, the the most direct competitor is obviously Astroscale from Japan, uh, who's working on exactly the same problem with uh, a clear direction toward the dock tag or the interfaces to 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 grapple an interface on the satellite uh, to remove satellites in end of life. Um, there's a few other companies working on on on, the, on some solutions. Uh, right now, I think the big barrier of entry is having a mission, concretely for most of those actors. Uh, that's what I what uh, what I was asking. It was not what do the startup do, what what do they propose, but what do the agencies, the other agencies propose? We applaud. That's fine. No, no I, I'm, I'm kidding. In in, in, your, in Europe, no. <coughs> in Europe, we have a target. No. Let's be let's be. Uh, I was joking. Uh, for instance, the agencies, we, we financed, it was nearly 10 years ago, we financed them, heavily financed, to our main industrials in Europe, all the activities about active debris removal, 
It was called OTV, OTV 1 and 2, with, uh, and you were participating, not you, but Muriel and, uh, and so on. And the idea was really, it was a study that lasted three years, just to be sure that they had, that we identified all the technology gaps that were necessary to, to go to comply with clean space and so on. And so, on. And so this was a, a, a preparation for all our uh, European network to be ready to, uh, for these kind of activities. And so this helps them to answer to the call from ESA and so on. And then, okay, and then we have other activities, but I... Uh, 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 my question was, uh, NASA has a budget that is four times that of ESA. Do they have a similar program? Uh, well, they, 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 they okay, have okay. satellite servicing, but not... <coughs> Up to up to very recently, the word active debris removal was not listed in uh, NASA or U.S. government. Okay? It just appeared in the government U.S. government number three uh, directive, where there is a line saying, "Okay, you should be ready for active debris removal." And so, since this, there is some activities, but not at all comparable to what is done here. Wait, do you correct me from no? As far as I know, you are yeah. completely right. Well, uh, so we've talked a lot about active debris removal, but recently different people from the uh, industry told me about another option. That was uh, debris collection, because some debris could be really interesting to have to collect some materials. It's, let's say the uh, short distance uh, space uh, mining. Uh, how do you think about uh, a space junkyard where you could collect some uh, alloys, some uh, composite material, composite materials? So, do you have any any idea about that? Uh, we we had a we had a study, a CNES with pl plenty of people. I think EPFL was in the was in the loop about what are the possibilities for recycling. And so we did a complete study about recycling, recycling on Earth, recycling in orbit, and so on and so on. So keep in mind that aluminum is worth two euro per kilo when it's new. Then when it's when it has spent ten years in orbit, I don't know in which shape you get it. In, uh, Brittle. Uh, yeah, and and so to be very clear, we we did not find much uh, possible. We found that you could cut big big chunks from tanks, for instance, and use them as a shield for uh, uh, human modules. It's not very noble, but this could be used. And then we found that potentially you could use them, melt them slightly, and extrude a kind of wire that could be used from, uh, for 3D printing. But then the quality of the material is probably very bad, so it's mainly maybe not credible. We even studied modifying the orbit of the of the launchers to crush them voluntarily in one given crater on the moon that we, that would be the lunar uh, junkyard where okay I need uh, I need five kilogram aluminum up you go and fetch it and you uh, but uh, it ended without any serious continuation let's say so it, in in CNES at least we we don't have anything serious about recycling, but maybe in ESA... I, I yeah, must in confess, ESA I'm, I'm impressed by the, by the kind of studies you have. <laughs> no, no. In ESA we are continuing. Yeah. We are not stopping, uh, uh, exactly. So there is a lot ongoing uh, on uh, um, in-orbit manufacturing, which could be a little bit the story of recycling from the point of view I take something and I redo it. Uh, there are, I have few colleagues who really believe in that. Um, I'm a bit more pragmatic. And uh, so it depends to whom you ask. It's nice to have colleagues being a, a, a public uh, a civilian research agency. I'm very proud that I have colleagues who work hard, who really come, contribute out with ideas. There is a steady low level of investment on this. Uh, it's what I would call a low level of investment. Today, uh, in no way you can propose to the member state a mission like that. We are trying to propose to the member state a mission on uh, uh, 
uh, in orbit servicing. But again, the first remark by the member state is who is the client and how much is going to pay for it. Uh, so today, the member states are not very much into this futuristic approach, so we keep it there. And one day, it will happen. Uh, and we go into the closer term uh, uh, in orbit servicing, which is uh, our CS takeover, refueling, of course, removing uh, these kind of things. Uh, I must confess I have an, uh, an idea of who could be the client, but it won't fit with ESA's uh, convention because, well, if you go to another satellite and do things on it, it might not be amicable. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, closed operations, I, I think it's something that you, you, you propose, uh, well, monitoring closed operations uh, on, uh, on satellites. Yes, we are uh, providing a service today uh, that we call proximity operations. And it's really a derivative of, of high-speed collisions, which we track with the Collision Avoidance Service. But if you look at some of the collisions, they happen in, they're very slow in, in forming. And they tend to fall in a few different categories in the future. Well, the immediate category they fall into is someone is doing undesirable tracking, gets in your orbital plane and starts doing maneuvers around your satellites. And we see some examples on that. But that same capability then would support the operations of Luke in, in conducting a debris removal activity. And it would also support the operations of Northrop or others in doing uh, on-orbit on uh, servicing. So that is, um, in, in all of this discussion, our role is pretty clear, which is to inform uh, setting the priorities on which objects to go after and how to manage a constellation as it's being populated and then to, uh, to provide continuous data to protect that because, you know, the constellations that are going into place now are going to have thousands of satellites and they all are going to be maneuvering all the time. So you need to have a completely different data set so you can automate the management of that and, and, and manage the risk. So it's, uh, it's going to be an exciting future. And there's also a, a, a very important point always regulation, always laws, that you can't intervene on a satellite that is not your own. You can. It depends what happens after. Yeah. I mean, nobody's going to stop you. The point yeah. is, uh, after, what's going to happen? And uh, yeah. particularly if you want to make it re-enter, how do you share the responsibility? I think that in the industry, it's, it's called casus belli. <laughs> and, uh, no, it's, it's, written, it's written in the treaties. Uh, if you tamper with another satellite, uh, it's casus belli. Clearly, the laws do not exist today. You're not allowed, as a, a European, you're not allowed to go and fetch a, a Russian debris. And even worse, you're not allowed to go and fetch a Russian debris, even if the Russian is okay and agrees and signs whatever. It's just legally, it's not possible. It's just a question of a, a launching state. And the worst is, if you do so, and so you go and fetch, for instance, uh, a funny thing in terms of catalog, uh, before doing the rendezvous, there are two objects in the catalog. After doing the rendezvous, there is only one <laughs> or two, or two with the same orbit, or this does not exist yet. And so you, you, you grab your Russian or whoever debris, you go down and you hit an active Japanese satellite. You, you, okay, you, so who is responsible? The Russian would say, oh, I was dead. I was not moving, okay. If you were not there, there would have not been a collision. So you see, there are, we, we're, we're working a lot on all our legal guys are working on it quite severely, but, but we're not ready yet. What, what happens with the ISS? Because the, the launching state of the ISS is the launching state of the first module, which in this case is Russia. Yes. In the catalog, the, the ISS is noted as the Zvezda. Interesting. Interesting. Um, I must confess, I just forgot my question. <laughs> I, I, uh, had, yes. I had a question because we, we discussed about the, the, the clamps on the satellites to help in the future. I was wondering if it will help uh, Alan because we're considering, for instance, asking to every satellite to have small radar corner reflectors or whatever or helping clues. 
Would this be a game changer for you or? We are, I think, very, very positive about the notion of having identifiable tags for everything to go up there because that's especially helpful, not on the on the deorbit and on the reentry side, but it's especially helpful because most of the risk of becoming debris is in deployment. So as I said, 25% of all the CubeSats are lost on deployment. And uh, it's a, a bit of a surprise to us, but the most uh, important service right now that we're providing to some of the commercial constellations is this launch and early orbit uh, support. So you see them quickly, you identify them quickly, and the identification that you're, you're talking about Yes, 100%. We think that would be a huge step forward. And we would support anything, any initiative like that. I think that in the, in the next uh, SpaceX launch with the transporter, there is a, a payload uh, that includes RFID identification for that kind of uh, problems. And another one was uh, proposing LEDs for visual identification. We're discussing this on, uh, at ISO level, currently at international level, with all our partners. And these are, these are interesting things to be included in standard. But it's a standard, then you apply it or not. Again, it's part of what we are discussing for the next uh, Sentinels. And we are having at the moment a strong discussion with our colleagues in Earth Observation and the primes of the future Sentinel because we would like to have them big. They want to have them small because at the end the satellite has to do another service and there is the story of the MLI so we are testing some of these uh, in the even in uh, STEC lab and uh, we will find a compromise. So again the next Sentinel will be equipped uh, with them and for us is a a go, and once we prove it, we hope they will go uh, on all the satellites. Well, I was just going to say that we've seen some really strong interest among uh, uh, space agencies around the world in, in being active in this. So they want to tie that kind of activity to the regulatory policy that they put out there. Uh, because it's in everyone's interest, the liability of the nation, putting objects in space and so on. So it's already got some traction. Yeah, and this is ongoing precisely within the uh, space traffic management activities that we discussed previously. Well, it does anyone has anything to add? Because we are will, we, we'll, coming at the end of the... Will clear space have a tag to get caught if you fail? You know? <laughs> Joking. Oh, we should probably look into that. Yeah. <laughs> but you won't fail. Well, well uh, I must confess, yesterday I was on, a, on French TV uh, discussing the uh, extravehicular activity of Thomas Pesquet and Shane Kimbrough uh, on the space station. And they were uh, putting new solar arrays on the station and they were working on the uh, front side of the space station, the most exposed to space debris. And, well, space debris was on French television yesterday because we talked a lot about that with uh, Jean-Francois Clairvoy. And the risk is there. In the end, something will happen. And, uh, well, let's hope uh, that we'll find solutions before that. Um, uh, I, I met in my career several astronauts, and I started to ask all of them, are you afraid of space debris? I must say that all of them replied to me, no, because we have procedure, no, because we know, and no, because we are trained to do something which is fantastic anyway, and dangerous anyway. <laughs> so it's not, uh, I'm not asking to somebody who's normal, let's say. <laughs> so they, they're still not yet worried about it. I would be, because they're there, and they are dangerous. If I, uh, we have one other data point. One of our founders is Edward Liu, who's a former NASA astronaut. Um, and he's leading the charge in our conversations with NASA, actually. Um, this is the number one risk to the space station for the last couple decades. Uh, it's identified as the number one risk. And they do, they do do, as you say, exercises to prepare for that. And I say, well, uh, Ed, how, is, um, how do you feel about that? And he goes, well, um, if it happens, it'll happen in a, a couple of milliseconds. It won't happen in the, you know, the, the 90 seconds that they get to do their, their uh, exercise. So um, 
we uh, safety of flight is one thing. Safety of life uh, is is another, and I think that's really going to escalate as a priority, uh, particularly as we see more space stations and more human space flight. If I can just add to it, I think we we had a lot of discussion with uh, operators of uh, commercial constellation and uh, uh, commercial satellites, and I think one of the concern there is also that if anything happens, if there's another event that happens in the future, what kind of regulation will come into play? And I think that's a huge concern for a lot of those operators feeling like suddenly there's going to be really harsh requirements and regulation in place or very harsh enforcement that might limit the, the freedom they have in operation. So it, it, it's, um, the, the question is what would happen if there's another event, right? And how will it evolve? So if, if you look at the past, at the history, um, not as as uh, Christoph was saying, not, nothing has been done. Well, I mean, a lot of regulation are in place, a lot of things have been discussed through, but they're not really enforced. What's happening right now is that everything is really accelerating, and I have the feeling that a lot of a lot of launching states start to feel the risk much more than they used to do a few years ago. So the question is, right now, what what we see also when we uh, in in the segment where we work, we were expecting when we looked at the future that this subject's gonna be, become more intense in the next five years. And what we see is there's much more going on in this segment uh, in the first two years than what we actually expected. So I think that there's a strong acceleration on the subject and uh, the question is where this complete exercise will be driven and what will happen next. Well, I think this will be the final word because we are told that we are too long. Uh, so this will be all for this year, but I think that space debris is a topic that will come back again and again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.